Hello class! Uh, this is going to be a video covering the highlights of chapter 9 for cash for uh, business 7 accounting for small business. Uh, so these are our learning objectives. The ones in bold I will cover and the ones that are not bold you can read on your own. They're secondary, not as important. So we will talk about a new account called cash short or over. Uh, I will also cover notes receivable or promissory notes, which is similar to accounts receivables, just they will be charging interest. We are lending money uh, and charging interest for it. Uh, we will talk about, oops, sorry. We'll talk about petty cash. There will be two journal transactions to establish a petty cash fund and then to reimburse it. Uh, I will not cover internal controls. You can read it on your own. Uh, I am also not going to cover this section on banking checks, how to endorse checks, how to prepare bank deposit slip. Uh, you can read it on your own. I will cover the bank statement reconciliation and the journal adjusting entries that result from that bank statement. And the last objective is about online banking, and you can read it in your book. Okay, so accounting for cash short or over. This is the account. It's a new account. Uh, it's a half expense, half revenue account. So it doesn't have a positive or negative, doesn't have a normal balance. A debit balance represents us being short uh, and considered to be an expense. A credit side represents us being over and is classified as revenue. So we're going to use this account, cash short or over. The name also shows short goes to the left, debit over goes to the right. So when you have your cash register and sometimes we make mistakes. So if our cash receipts are less than the sales, and the sales are represented by the cash register tape. So if our cash after we subtract the ch change fund is less than our sales on the cash register tape, we are short. So the amount that we are short, we will debit. If our cash receipts are higher than the sales, then it's considered to be an overage and it will be a credit to this account. In general, cash tends to be short more often than over because customers are more likely to notice and complain if they receive not enough change. So usually this account will end up being debited more often than credited. So at the end of the period, it will have usually debit balance and it goes as an expense on the income statement. So here is an example. We have 200 change fund. Our cash sales per cash register tape are $2,200. When we count cash, we have 2,397. So first of all, we need to subtract change fund. So this is our cash in the cash register minus the change fund gives us 2,197. We were supposed to have 2,200. So we are $3 short. This is how you record it. Your cash register tape minus change fund is the amount of cash debit. Your sales per cash register tape go as a credit to sales. And the difference is us being short, we debit it right here. Cash short over debit. Here is another example when we are over we have cash register tape 2100 so that's sales 2100 our cash count is 2301 minus 200 change fund so we actually have 2101 which means we are one dollar over so when you're over so cash debited sales credited the missing amount is a credit to cash short or over which means we're over the next section covers promissory notes. A promissory note is uh, I owe you, is an I owe you note. It's a loan. It's the amount that we give out to our uh, customers. Uh, 
Uh, it's very similar to accounts receivable, but more formal. There is actual note to be signed. It's uh, usually we uh, sign this note for larger amounts of transactions, longer period of times, riskier customers. Most of the promissory notes have an interest, and this interest we will have to calculate. It's always expressed per year. But here we assume notes with the length less than a year. So it will be three months or half a year. So we will have to calculate the interest applicable to the uh, period for which uh, the note is issued. Um, the account connected to promissory notes is called notes receivable for the principal. For the interest that we earn, we will use this account called interest revenue. So note receivable is an asset plus minus interest revenue is revenue minus plus. Uh, we will often use it when the customer got accounts receivable. They purchased from us on account, let's say, for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, the customer doesn't have money to pay us. So we give them an extension of the credit. We give them, let's say, four more months and transfer their balance from AR into the note. But now for the additional four months, we're going to start charging them interest. So it's given as an extension of credit. We replace an existing account receivable, accounts receivable with a note receivable. So here is an example of the note. We are the lender. Our customer is Stacy. She will owe us money. We're giving her $800 for six months. So at the end of six months, today is July 31st, uh, the end of six months will be January 31st. She will have to pay us $800 back, that's the principal, plus the interest of 9%, but applicable just for that six months. So it's really going to be 4.5%, a half of this. So here is the amount of principal, the interest rate. So principal we abbreviate as P, the interest rate is R, and then we have the maturity date. Maturity, when the note matures. We assume here we're going to get one payment at the maturity. So Stacy will pay us back principal plus interest at maturity. So this is what we did for Stacy. Stacy owed us $800 on accounts receivable. She doesn't have money to pay. So we extend the credit. We eliminate accounts receivables by crediting them. And we accept a note from her. I owe you note for $800. Debit NR, credit AR. This is July 31st. On January 31st, six months later, we collect from her $836, which is principal of $800 plus the interest of $36. Let me show you how to calculate this interest. This is considered to be simple interest. Uh, as opposed to the compound interest, which is more complicated and calculated on any loans that are long-term, more than a year. You will study compound interest in Business 1A and Business 1B. So this is a formula for simple interest. Interest equals principal multiplied, multiplied by rate multiplied by time, PRT. So let's plug in. My principal is $800, my interest is 9% per year, and my time is 6 out of 12 months, which is a half a year. So pretty much my, my interest is a half of 9%, or 4.5%, multiplied by $800 equals to $36. So the amount I collect is principal plus Interest, should not say rate here, should say here interest, the amount of interest, and it's equal to $836. We debit cash, we credit these two new accounts. Interest income is a revenue goes up, notes receivable goes down because we have collected. The next topic is a petty cash fund. So petty cash are funds that are set up to make payments for purchases of small items like post postage or supplies. Uh, it's an actual cash on hand. 
It needs to be handled by anybody but not an accountant. We have to separate the duties. So a person who handles a petty cash fund uh, should be an admin or an office manager or the owner of the small business. Every time we make a payment, it's actually giving actual cash out of the safe. And when we give payments out for small expenditures, for small trivial purchases, uh, it makes sense to use these vouchers, pre-numbered vouchers. So right here, we paid $16.25 for office supplies, uh, because it wouldn't make sense to, uh, you know, write the check for such a small amount. And so you have, but you're still keeping track of where uh, you spend the petty cash funds. So first of all, we need to establish the petty cash fund. The company decides how much funds they want. Let's say we want $175 per month. So at the beginning of the month, we're going to write a check to ourselves. To ourselves we pretty much withdraw cash from your checking account so we debit petty cash it's a new account it's an asset plus minus and we take it out of checking account so we credit cash uh, how do we re uh, replenish it at the end of the month the person who handles the petty cash fund sends the information to the accountant or bookkeeper. So let's say there are all these different vouchers and when we summarize them, we see that we paid out $30.25 for supplies, $41.50 for delivery expense. And again, it might not have been one payment. It might have been multiple payments, but together, $41.50. The owner withdrew $25 and other expenses like postage and mailing and, you know, maybe tips for pizza delivered to the office uh, constitute $63. So these are my total expenditures. All of these accounts we debit. We debit supplies, delivery expense, drawing, miscellaneous expense. It means we spent $159.75 out of $175. So we want to make sure nothing has been misplayed or misplaced or stolen. So we should still have in the safe, in the secure box, $15.25 left of cash. If we have less, that means something happened, money was re, you know mishandled or lost, and we could use our account called cash short or over. But in this example, Actually, everything matches. We have $15.25 left. So how much should I replenish the petty cash fund? The amount is $159.75. This is the withdrawal from my checking account. This is another amount I withdraw from my cash account. I want you to look at this entry. There is no petty cash fund impacted. When you replenish the petty cash fund, you debit accounts uh, where you spend money and you credit cash. There is no petty cash fund here. So you will have some homework problems where you have to establish the fund and then replenish it. Just two types of journal transactions. Okay, internal controls I'm going to skip. You have the slides, you have it in the book. You can go over them yourselves. I'm not going to spend time lecturing. Uh, it's a very important topic. Internal controls allow us to prevent, uh, prevent fraud, prevent theft, prevent employees stealing cash from us. But the information is pretty straightforward. Uh, also, most of you know how to do banking. So this is an example of the check. This is the drawer. This is the party that withdraws money. So if you write a check, you are the drawer. Uh, this is the drawee. This is the bank which holds your money. And this is the payee. This is the party to whom you're making a payment. Uh, this is the check stub. They show you how to do check stubs. Again, you can look at it yourselves. And then uh, the last concept here are the endorsements. So there are three types of endorsements, full, blank, and restrictive. And 
the best one, the most secure one that businesses should use. And businesses usually have a stamp. It's a restrictive endorsement. What you and I personally do, we usually do blank endorsement. So if the check is lost, anybody can deposit it. So the more restrictive endorsement, uh, the best, most safe endorsement, I should say, is called restrictive. Okay, this is the other large topic uh, in this chapter. You will have this type of problem on your test, on your uh, homework, and it's called uh, bank statement reconciliation and the connected journal adjustments. So at the end of every month, so let's say in the beginning of every month, we receive a bank statement. And when we look at the bank statement balance, it is almost always going to be different from my book balance, from the balance of cash in my general ledger. Uh, why? These are, excuse me, six reasons why the book balance may not be the same as the bank balance. Outstanding checks. So you write a check as soon as you wrote it, as soon as you mailed it, you credit your cash account. But it takes a few days for the check to be cleared through the bank. So sometimes the checks that you wrote at the end of the month have been deducted from your books, from your ledger, from your cash on the ledger, but they have not cleared the bank yet. So it's one discrepancy. By the way, when the check is paid, the bank cancels it. It doesn't mean it's been stopped. It means we paid the check that the company wrote, we mean in the bank. So the check is now canceled. And usually those canceled checks, checks that have been paid, are sent back to the business. So whatever checks you wrote, but they have not been canceled, they are called outstanding checks. Uh, similarly, there are deposits in transit. I made a deposit at the end of the month. It, it was on Friday, so the bank will not receive it, will not process it till Monday or Tuesday, which could be the next month. So in my records, in my cash account on the ledger, I increased debited cash, but the bank statement does not reflect it. Third reason, any deductions that we don't know about. So the bank might have charged us different fees, fines, service charges for different reasons, or we might have received a check from a customer, we deposited it, and we debited the cash account, but it was a bad check. We call it NSF check, no sufficient funds. So for that check, sometimes the bank also charges us, us and we need to now adjust our records and notify the customer that they owe us the money. So deductions not recorded in my books, in my cash account on the ledger. And also we might have deposits, increases. Like for example, we earned some interest or the bank collected a, a, a note on our behalf with interest or without interest. And the fifth and the sixth are errors. Banks make errors. And also in the process of the bank statement reconciliation, we might discover some of our accounting or bookkeeping errors. So, to make bank statement balance equal to our book balance, we have to go through a series of steps and we prepare a report called Bank Reconciliation Statement. It's a great internal control tool. It's actually required by GAP. It allows us to discover errors and it also results in the necessary journal adjustments to the cash account and some other accounts. So this is the format. It's easy to get confused here, but I want you to think of your bank reconciliation statement as having two sections. You can list first section first and then second below it, or you can list them side by side just like this. Uh, the format is not very important. You can follow the format given in Connect, given in your textbook. But again, it's not a financial statement. It doesn't really matter how it looks like. I want you to focus not on the format, but on the structure, on the concept. So in the first section, we start with the balance from the bank. This is very important to remember. Bank statement balance is the first step. Bank statement balance. First step. 
uh, we will add subtract any transactions that we recorded but the bank did not know about again we knew about them we recorded them but they are missing from the bank statement so first of all we're gonna add any deposits in transit and you might not have any and then we're gonna subtract outstanding checks you could have none you could have a few uh, also here we add or subtract depending on the situation bank errors these errors become confusing so I'm not going to give you any problems with, which include errors on the test. And then after we do this, we have an adjusted bank balance right here. Second section, again, that section could go below, could be side by side, focuses on our books. So we're going to start, let me do the pen again. We're going to start with the balance in my ledger book balance means cash balance from the general ledger so right here they're not equal bank statement and book balance are not equal our goal is to reconcile make my adjusted balances be the, to be the same so the second i'm sorry the sixth step we're gonna add and subtract cash transactions that the bank knew about but we did not we did not record them so we need to record them now we're gonna add any deposits not recorded such as interest we earn or a note collection when the bank collects a note on our behalf and we're gonna subtract any deductions such as service charges for printing checks or any kind of fines or NSF no sufficient funds checks and then guys we might discover any kind of book errors my own my accounting errors and then we're gonna have an adjusted book balance so on the bottom my adjusted bank balance and book balance will be the same so I'll show you an example right now I do want to mention that after we prepare this bank reconciliation statement we have to take we have to focus only on the only on this oops let me go back we, we're gonna focus only on the second section we're gonna take second section and we have to journalize these deposits this deduction and these errors they're gonna become our adjusting entries we're going to put them in the journal because i did not know about them these guys on the in the first section i don't have to do anything about them because they are already in my books they are not reflected on the bank side but the book side needs to add addition add journal transactions so after i post this additional journal transactions my cash is balanced will be equal to the adjusted book balance so right now my cash balance is here but it needs to go right here with the adjustments okay let me go through an example i'm using an example which is different from your textbook so bank statement balance given general ledger cash given they're not the same as you can see there is difference of seventy five hundred dollars approximately these are different events so I want to look at each event, each transaction, and I want us to classify it. Is it uh, does it affect the bank side, the first section, or the book side, the second section? And is it a plus or a minus? Let me put them all up there. Okay. So let me do this pen color. Let me make it red. Okay. So bank collected a note on our behalf principal and interest this is an event we did not know about so it goes on the book side book side book side and guys we're gonna add it right the bank collected a note received the payment from our customer so we're gonna increase our cash by 2310 book plus uh, a deposit that we made on January 31st was not recorded so I knew about it I don't have to worry about it but the bank does not know about it so I will say here bank I'll just abbreviate BA 
and it's going to be a deduction, sec section one. These are outstanding checks for 2050, 3000, 13, 12. I will add them together and this goes to the bank section. Bank did not know about it. Oops, I'm sorry. The deposit has to be added. So outstanding checks have to be subtracted. And then uh, the bank sh statement shows that there was a bad check from Ann Holloway, our customer, for 277. So I have to put it on the book side. I will just abbreviate BO, and it's going to be a minus to cash. We earned interest. That goes on our second section, book side, and it's an addition plus. And a bank charged us for printing checks $13. I did not know about it, so it goes to the book side, and I'm going to subtract it. So it makes sense to classify the transactions. Is it bank side or book side? Is it an increase or decrease? And then just plug them in. So let's prepare the bank reconciliation statement. Here it is. So first, put the bank statement balance. Don't put book bank statement. So this is section one right here is section, oops, one. This is section two right here is section two. Step one, bank statement balance. Step two, add any deposits in transit. So we add it, we have now 28,707. Step three, deduct outstanding checks. So we have three checks. This is the total of outstanding checks. They have not cleared the bank. So we take 28,707. We deduct 7,362, which is a total of three checks. We get adjusted bank balance of uh, 22,345. I'm not giving you any examples of errors in this problem because I will not have it on the test. So no step four. Step five. What is our book balance given? Add any deposits we did not record. Oops, six. So we had uh, one deposit of a note collection with interest. I added those together. 2310. And it's 2310. So we get with you 20,325. Plus 2310 gives me 22,635. And then step seven, uh, any deductions that we did not record. And there was a bad check and bank service, bank service charge, which is uh, together $290. So we take $22,635 minus $290 gives us $22,345. So adjusted book balance, I'm sorry, the adjusted bank balance and the adjusted book balance are the same. We reconciled. So next step, we're going to take second section and we're going to journalize adjusting entries uh, for the book side of the reconciliation. So we're going to have two transactions, one that reflects a debit increase to cash and the second one that reflects a minus decrease to cash. So you will have to do the same on the test and in your homework. You prepare this bank reconciliation statement and then you journalize adjustments based on the book section, second section. So guys, for the addition, I'm going to debit cash right here, 2310. I'm going to credit note collection with interest, I'm going to actually, no, no, note collection, so this is for the note, um, note receivable, and I'm going to credit increase interest earned uh, with the account called interest revenue or interest income. Here you go, debit cash, credit notes receivable for the principal, and credit interest income uh, for the amount of interest. This is a description to record note collected with interest. And the second transaction, cash goes down. So I'm going to credit cash by 290, credit cash by 290, and I'm going to debit. So this was a bad check 
from Holloway, from the customer. So she owes me $277. So I'm debiting the AR, the accounts receivable account, uh, because she wrote the bad check. So now I have to charge her again. And then the bank service charge, I am debiting this new account called bank service expense. Make sure there's a word expense. It could be called miscellaneous expense, expense banking expense, uh, but it has to have the word expense. Now, students sometimes separate these entries into two separate ones, one for the bad check, another one for bank service charge, which is fine, but I'm trying to be efficient and, uh, you know, I'm combining both transactions for the deduction and cash together. I found a mistake. So this is, uh, the description is to record the NSF check and a bank charge. So this is probably the most challenging part of Chapter 9. Bank statement reconciliation and the journal transactions. Just practice, practice, practice. Uh, and you will get it. It's a good skill to have even for your personal finances, not the journal transactions, but uh, trying to reconcile uh, your checkbook with the bank statement. After this, the textbook concludes with the online banking. I'm sure a lot of you use it, so I'm not going to go over it. It concludes chapter nine. Thank you so much and uh, study hard.